March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Since then, we've been locked down four times. I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. We've received a daily death toll. The UK death toll now stands at 3,605. We've been refused medical treatment. Coronavirus is having a devastating effect on cancer treatment. We've received curfews. Boris Johnson will tomorrow uh, institute a 10 p.m. curfew on pubs up and down the country. We've had our businesses closed. You know what's going on is wrong. You know it as well. We've lost jobs. <laughs> We've been restricted from seeing loved ones. Hang on a minute, don't take her away. Hey, don't take her away! Don't take her away! We've not been allowed to socialise. The struggle ended with Beth taking her own life. We've been forbidden to protest. Tell me what law I have broken. You cannot tell me any law that I've broken. We've been assaulted. Hey, look what they're doing. Look at this old lady. Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. It's all up. Oh, hey. We've been arrested and fined. What a disgrace. You must have mothers. What an outrage. She was an old lady robbed of her dignity for having the courage to protest. All this has been imposed using bad data. The ONS data uh, this week came out and said that it was um, it had been downgraded. So the lockdown too was based again on dodgy numbers. False infection rates. According to a report in this morning's Times, 30% uh, of test results uh, give false positive. The, the app will only tell you to self-isolate if you've been in close contact with somebody who's tested positive. Yeah, but they, but they could be false positives. Well, you will have had to be in close contact with somebody for it to tell you to self-isolate. Yeah, who, but their test in itself might have been a false positive. And inflated mortality rates. The definition of a coronavirus death is someone who dies for any reason within 28 days of positive test. Now they have accelerated the release of a vaccine. But will life return to normal? I mean, just simple words there, reacting it. You're quite emotional about that. Well, it's just, uh, it's been, you know, it's been such a tough year for so many people and, you know, we can get on with our lives. Or will we see a new normal? A world with harsh, tyrannical rules governed by a centralised totalitarian state? Since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, many have speculated that it's been planned by a group of tech elites who are dictating to governments globally. But do these ideas carry any weight? And what might their motives be for orchestrating a global pandemic? To understand, we must first explore a significant shift that's been taking place in our economy, one that only a minority of people are aware of. It's called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. To date, there have been three industrial revolutions. The first happened in the late 1700s with the invention of the steam engine, which led to the creation of factories and a booming textile industry. In the late 1800s, the second industrial revolution was marked by mass production, as well as new industries like steel and electricity. And the third happened in the late 1900s, which saw the invention of the computer and the internet. Now, the fourth industrial revolution describes the emergence of artificial intelligence and how it integrates more with humans. Artificial intelligence, or AI, can already be seen in our daily lives, from how we check out at the supermarket to how we check in for a flight. But it's far more advanced than most people realise. In August 2020, entrepreneur Elon Musk gave a demo of his new company, Neuralink. Connected to our brains with tiny wires, this microchip is synced with AI, enabling humans to control anything from prosthetic limbs to computer games. 
This working proof of concept has already been fitted into people. It has the potential to completely transform the way we interact online. So there's actually a lot of functions that this device could do uh, related to monitoring your health and warning you about a possible heart attack or stroke or other uh, damage, as well as uh, sort of convenience features like playing music. Um, you can do a lot. Um, it's sort of like if your phone went at your brain or something. It's a cyborg. It's a, it's a combination. It's a combination of electronics and biology. Yeah. Things are getting more and more connected. Kai Fu Li is the former president of Google China and Microsoft Research China, as well as the author of New York Times bestseller, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. Kai Fu believes that China will be the AI superpower within five years. For those of you who haven't been to China for the three years, please be careful when you go because your credit card and cash may not be accepted. Uh, China has pretty much been taken over by mobile payment. In the age of AI, if data is the new oil, then China is the new Saudi Arabia. One concern that is topical in the development of AI is the displacement of jobs. Robots are clearly replacing people's jobs. They're working 24 by 7. They're more efficient. So therefore, are you convinced long term that we're going to have a jobs problem in the world? Uh, not long term, but maybe in the next uh, 10 years, within the next 10 years. You mean it's going to happen much sooner? Much sooner. If a lot of people will find happiness without working, that would be a happy outcome. At Amazon fulfillment centers, robots transport items to humans who then pack them to be delivered. Amazon believes that within 10 years, they will not need a single human to fulfill an order. According to the World Economic Forum, 50% of the workforce will need reskilling by 2025. And it's likely that only a fraction of these will find work, resulting in a large proportion of the workforce becoming unemployed. It's a pretty good chance we, we end up with a universal basic income or something like that due to automation. You know, people have time to do other things and have more complex things, more interesting things, uh, certainly more leisure time. And then we've got to figure out how we integrate with a world in the future with advanced AI. One idea that is gaining popularity is to charge tech companies with a robot tax, which can be distributed to the unemployed as a universal basic income. I don't think the robot companies are going to you know, be outraged that there might be a tax. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Contrary to the past to the previous three revolutions, probably jobs will be faster destroyed compared to new ones uh, being created. This is Klaus Schwab, the author of this book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. He's also the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum which is funded by the largest global enterprises and whose members include CEOs, heads of state and government ministers from countries such as the UK and US. The fourth industrial revolution will impact our lives completely. It will change actually us, our own identity, which of course gives life uh, to such uh, policies and uh, developments like uh, smart traffic, smart government, smart cities. In June 2019, the UK government published details about their partnership with the World Economic Forum in a policy called Regulation for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. One year later, in June 2020, the World Economic Forum released this promotional video entitled The Great Reset. The purpose for this film is to imply that everything from economics to our culture needs to change. After the reset, it shows images of digital technology biological cells, populations, cash, climate change, traffic management, and this. Seem familiar? This promotional video was released six months before Margaret Keenan, 
receive the first COVID-19 vaccine. In November 2020, Time magazine published The Great Reset on their front cover. The World Economic Forum's managing director, Jeremy Jargons, believes that it will have a devastating impact on our economy. You know, if we look at The Great Reset, you know, we're still at the early stages of a global crisis that's going to forever uh, transform society. You know, when it first started, people said, OK, this is the biggest crisis to hit since 2007, 2008 financial crisis. And then a little bit later, they said, oh, wow, this is the biggest crisis since World War II. Now we're looking at them and saying, oh, look, this is comparable to what happened in the Great Depression. Politicians are also endorsing the campaign. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. This is our chance to accelerate our pre-pandemic efforts to reimagine economic systems. History would look at this crisis as the great opportunity for reset. All elements of the Great Reset are fundamental to building the future we need. And it's even promoted by the royal family, who posted this video on their YouTube page with the Great Reset hashtag. We are on the verge of catalytic breakthroughs that will alter our view of what is possible and profitable within the framework of a sustainable future. We need nothing short of a paradigm shift, one that inspires action at revolutionary levels and pace. We simply cannot waste any more time. The only limit is our willingness to act. And the time to act is now. The World Economic Forum believes that capitalism needs to be reinvented. The Build Back Better slogan has been adopted by politicians across the globe. This moment also gives us a much greater chance to be radical and to do things differently. To build back better. Because we can only build back better if we lean on one another. Over the last two weeks, I've shared my agenda for economic recovery. I call it Build Back Better because we can't just build back to the way things were before. We have to do it better. And the first plank of my Build Back Better plan rejects the defeatist view that, autom that automation and globalization mean we can't assure American workers lead to a future made in America. So what does the world look like after the Great Reset? This social media post by the World Economic Forum demonstrates eight predictions by 2030. Here are three of them. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Whatever you want, you'll rent and it'll be delivered by drone. And Western values will have been tested to the breaking point. Many of Boris Johnson's new policies fall in line with the World Economic Forum's objectives. In November 2020, his new green industrial revolution plan included a ban on petrol and diesel cars by 2030. Combined with other current restrictions, such as blocking vehicle access to side roads, causing gridlock on main roads, extending the congestion zone, and introducing a paper mile road tax. One might think that he's attempting to remove ownership of cars. The biggest application is the um, autonomous driving. This is going to replace the entire transportation uh, that we have, we're used to today. You will no longer buy cars. Your car is parked 96% at the time, so it's depreciating. How bad is that for an investment, right? Only 4% of the time is it getting you from place A to place B. But imagine there is an Uber that gets here in 30 seconds and is very reliable, very clean, and there's no nasty driver because there is no driver, and it's very safe. Uh, would you not, not buy a car? One thing about AI is it gets better with data. In 10 years after its first launch, it will probably be so much better than people, most of us will be afraid to drive. You know why? Because autonomous vehicles will start talking to each other. They will miss each other by one centimeter. 
And we as humans are will become our worst enemies because we're going to be the threat to our lives. The machines are going to be safe. And pretty soon after that, humans will be disallowed from driving. Suppose you're a 50 years old truck driver and you just lost your job to a self-driving vehicle. Now there are new jobs in designing software or in teaching yoga to engineers. But how does a 50 years old truck driver reinvent himself or herself as a software engineer or as a yoga teacher? Because AI is nowhere near its full potential. All jobs will disappear, new jobs will emerge, but then the new jobs will rapidly change and vanish. At the World Economic Forum 2020 annual meeting in Davos, Historian, philosopher and author Yuval Noel Harari warned the audience about the dangers of artificial intelligence. We hear so much about the enormous promises of technology and these promises are certainly real, but technology might also disrupt human society and the very meaning of human life in numerous ways, ranging from the creation of a global useless class to the rise of data colonialism and of digital dictatorships. Those who fail in the struggle against irrelevance would constitute a new useless class. And this useless class will be separated by an ever growing gap from the ever more powerful elite. We are already in the midst of an AI arms race, with China and the USA leading the race, and most countries being left far, far behind. AI will likely create immense wealth in a few high-tech hubs, while other countries will either go bankrupt or will become exploited data colonies. Just think, what will happen to developing economies once it is cheaper to produce cars in California than in Mexico? And what will happen to politics in your country in 20 years when somebody in San Francisco or in Beijing knows the entire medical and personal history of every politician and every journalist in your country including all their sexual escapades, all their mental weaknesses, and all their corrupt dealings. When you have enough data, you don't need to send soldiers in order to control a country. Between the beginning of the pandemic and August 2020 alone, seven Silicon Valley tech giants added nearly 2.5 trillion to their market values, 400 billion of which was added by Microsoft. Founder Bill Gates also has an interest in vaccines, where he, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, owns stock in the vaccine manufacturing companies Pfizer and Moderna. Both companies have been developing a new generation of vaccines that interacts directly with our DNA. Traditional immunization methods involve injecting a dead or a weakened form of the virus. This triggers the immune system to create antibodies, which helps to protect us in the case of a virus getting into our system. Pfizer's and Moderna's new messenger RNA technology, however, is not a standard immunization vaccine, but rather genetic engineering. Instead of injecting a virus into the patient, their approach is to inject synthetic molecules that transport instructions to the cell on how to create antibodies to fight the virus. Up until November 2020, no messenger RNA vaccine had ever been approved for use on humans. On the 21st of November 2020, The Lancet expressed disappointment that the COVID-19 vaccine trial results were announced via press releases, leaving many scientific uncertainties due to the lack of safety data. The publication also expressed uncertainty on how well the vaccines work in older people or those with underlying conditions as well as their efficacy in preventing severe disease. In early December 2020, a group of medical doctors from around the world created a video to warn the public about the safety of the vaccine. Due to the excuse of a global pandemic, the pharma industry 
has the permission to skip the animal trials. This means that we humans will be the guinea pigs. This vaccine has been developed too quickly. We have no idea what the long-term effects will be. An experiment on humanity. There is only limited short-term safety data and no long-term safety data to rule out late-onset negative effects like autoimmune diseases, infertility and cancers. Please be critical. Do your own research and don't let the media manipulate you. This is the first time ever this will ever be launched on the human race. There are so many different awful things that can happen to us and we need to investigate this before we go forward. This is my alarm call to the world. On the 19th of December 2020, the CDC published this report by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Just one day after the UK initiated vaccination with the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, authorities confirmed two cases of anaphylaxis, which is a very serious allergic reaction that is rapid in onset and may cause death. On page six, under the title, V-Safe Active Surveillance for COVID-19 Vaccines, 3,150, or 2.8%, of the 112,807 vaccine recipients were unable to perform normal daily activities, unable to work, or required care from a doctor or healthcare professional. If 60 million people in the UK have the vaccine, we can expect 1.67 million people to be unable to work, unable to perform normal daily activities and to require care. I don't know how long for. If six billion people worldwide have the vaccine, then the number rises to 167 million. And this, remember, is a short-term problem. We don't know what will happen in the medium and long term. The side effects for the Moderna vaccine sound concerning. We looked. After the second dose, at least 80% of participants experienced a systemic side effect, ranging from severe chills to fevers. So are these vaccines safe? Well, the, uh, the FDA not being pressured will look hard at that. The FDA is the gold standard of regulators uh, and their current guidance on this, if they stick with that, is is very, very appropriate. Uh, and, you know, the, it, the, 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 the side effects were not super severe. That is, it didn't cause permanent health problems for uh, the things there. They, you know, Moderna did have to go with a fairly high dose. And so, uh, you know, to get the antibodies. Some of the other vaccines uh, are going able to go with lower doses to get uh, responses that are, are pretty high, including the, the J&J and the Pfizer. And so there's a lot of characteristics of these vaccines. Um, it's great that we have multiple of them uh, that I are going out there. And, and yes, I you, think- You know the data the better than I do. But the bill, bill the, the data showed that everybody with a high dose had a, a side effect. In addition to their interest in vaccines, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation donates money to media organisations such as the BBC, universities that provide media representatives, and in partnership with the World Economic Forum, Event 201, which simulated a coronavirus-induced pandemic five months prior to the actual pandemic. On behalf of our center and our partners, the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our audience here in New York. The goal of the Event 201 exercise is to illustrate the potential consequences of a pandemic and the kinds of societal and economic challenges it would pose. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care. Many died. Experts agree unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. 
The scenario also highlights the very critical role that global business and public-private partnerships play in preparing for and responding to pandemics. By the turn of the 20th century, 90% of all U.S. refineries were controlled by John Rockefeller, who went on to monopolize the pharmaceutical industry. He had six children who founded Venrock, a venture capital company which made investments in tech companies such as Apple and Intel. In 2010, the Rockefeller Foundation released a document called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development, which described a pandemic scenario with the headline, A World of Tighter Top-Down Government Control and More Authoritarian Leadership. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions, from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks. Citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy in exchange for greater safety and stability. This heightened oversight took many forms, such as biometric IDs for all citizens. While there's no evidence to suggest that this 10-year-old document has any relation to the current pandemic, it was accurate in predicting many extreme restrictions that are being imposed on us today. Recently, in December 2020, the Rockefeller Foundation published this report. COVID-19 vaccines have arrived, with enough supply to vaccinate as many as 50 million people by the end of January. But these initial doses will do little in the short term to arrest an epidemic that is raging out of control. By the end of January, the country will likely be able to conduct more than 70 million tests each week a number that is expected to double to 200 million by April 2021. They advise the US government, students should be tested at least once a week, every week. Does advice from a large US organization have the potential to influence UK government policy? The Health Secretary this evening announced an emergency targeted testing program for secondary schools. We've decided to put in place an immediate plan for testing all secondary school age children in the seven worst affected boroughs of London, in parts of Essex that border London and parts of Kent. The test used to detect positive cases is called PCR and it only requires very small samples to see if there's any virus present. Now PCR doesn't tell you if what it detects is infectious. It may pick up on virus fragments from a past infection that isn't currently making you sick. Now this means there could be false positives, so there's a positive test result, but no active infection. Let's deal with this test for infection, the PCR. I want to ask you if you think it's reliable enough, Dr. Daniels. I'm an NHS clinician and we've got experience with these PCR tests for many, many years. And the reality is we always take the results with a little bit of a pinch of salt. You test a thousand people, one of whom is positive, but the test will pick up six people if it's got a 0.5% false positive rate. That's significant if it's being used to drive policy decisions. If you're tested repeatedly, the odds become greater and greater that you will get a positive test and it's a convenience for whoever is playing some macabre game because I don't think it's an error anymore uh, but the, this industrial scale PCR test they don't release even the basic information about it like the false positive rate it's unbelievable the public health people who do know better I've spoken to some people in it and they're embarrassed they're not even being allowed to characterize and publish the information you would need to know to work out how useful the test is that's not being done it's full steam ahead with the PCR test providing a high rate of false positives, is their intention to boost infection rates in order to justify more lockdowns? In the early 90s, disease mongering was a strategy coined by pharmaceutical companies for creating a disease and scaring people, then offering a pre-planned drug. If today's most powerful people wanted to accelerate the shift towards the fourth industrial revolution, by removing jobs and reinventing capitalism, this problem-reaction-solution strategy would be effective in achieving it. 1. Create a problem. Release a coronavirus and declare a global pandemic. 
The coronavirus outbreak has been declared a pandemic. To create a reaction. Ramp up fear with a propaganda campaign and destroy the economy by forcing businesses to close. We are collectively telling, telling cafes, pubs, bars and restaurants to close tonight as soon as they reasonably can and not to open tomorrow. Three, create a solution. Provide the mass unemployed with a universal basic income credited onto the Rockefeller and Microsoft-backed digital IDs that are implanted into our hands. You can create a digital ID today. It's a natural evolution of the way that we're going to use technology in any event to transact daily life. And this COVID crisis gives an additional reason for doing that. Coerce us into taking tech-based vaccines and staying at home and require us to reside within smart cities with totalitarian-like surveillance. Well, let's see how long it uh, takes you to find me. Right behind me, you can see uh, just over, over my left shoulder there. Hello, guys. I've been expecting you. In return for giving us the universal basic income, are these the conditions they will require? Smart cities will pollulate with sensors, all joined together by the Internet of Things. And the urban environment is as antiseptic as a Zurich pharmacy. But this technology could also be used to keep every citizen under round-the-clock surveillance. A future Alexa will pretend to take orders, but this Alexa will be watching you, clucking her tongue and stamping her foot. In future, voice connectivity will be in every room and almost every object. Your mattress will monitor your nightmares. Your fridge will beep for more cheese. Your front door will sweep wide the moment you approach like some silent butler. Your smart meter will go hustling of its own accord for the cheapest electricity and every one of them minutely transcribing your every habit in tiny electronic shorthand stored not in their chips or in their innards nowhere you can find it but in some great cloud of data that lowers ever more oppressively over the human race AI what will it mean? helpful robots washing and caring for an aging population or pink-eyed terminators sent back from the future to cull the human race. If this pandemic was planned, why would now be the perfect time to activate it? The answer could be 5G. It's 100 times faster than 4G and it's now ready to be rolled out. This upgrade in performance is essential for digitizing society connecting humanity more closely with the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. They haven't done a very good job about protecting public health, but they've done a very good job at using the quarantine to bring 5G into all of our communities and to begin the process of shifting us all to a digital currency, which is the beginning of slavery. Because if they control your bank account, they control your behavior. And we all see these advertisements saying 5G is coming to your community. It's going to make all of your lives so much better. And it's very convincing, I have to say. This is a game changer. Because I look at those ads and I think, that's great. I can hardly wait till it gets here. Because I'm going to be able to download a video game in six seconds instead of 16 seconds. And is that why they're spending $5 trillion on 5G? No. The reason is for surveillance and data harvesting. It's not for you and me. It's for Bill Gates. It's for Zuckerberg. And it's for Bezos and all of the other billionaires. Bill Gates says that his satellite fleet will be able to look at every square inch of the planet 24 hours a day. But that's only the beginning. He also will be able to follow you on all of your smart devices through biometric facial recognition, through your GPS. You think that Alexa is working for you. 
She isn't working for you. She's working for Bill Gates, spying on you. And the pandemic is a crisis of convenience for the elites who are dictating these policies. It gives them the ability to obliterate the middle class, to destroy the institutions of democracy, to shift all of our wealth from all of us to a handful of billionaires to make themselves rich by impoverishing the rest of us. If you know enough biology and you have enough computing power and data, you can hack my body and my brain and my life. A system that understands us better than we understand ourselves can predict our feelings and decisions, can manipulate our feelings and decisions, and can ultimately make decisions for us. Now, in the past, many tyrants and governments wanted to do it, but nobody understood biology well enough, and nobody had enough computing power and data to hack millions of people. Neither the Gestapo nor the KGB could do it. But soon, at least some corporations and governments will be able to systematically hack all the people. We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. The power to hack human beings can of course be used for good purposes, like providing much better healthcare. But if this power falls into the hands of a 21st century Stalin, the result will be the worst totalitarian regime in human history, and we already have a number of applicants for the job. Thousands of Brits have been taken to the streets to peacefully protest. I'm a chef and the hospitality trade is in ruins with the policies that are being put in place and I was made redundant on the 3rd of um, July and I've not been able to find um, work since. A couple more months and I won't be able to afford my rent. But. As with all other Covid-related protests, this one was terminated early when the riot police aggressively intervened. I was quite shocked, particularly by the behaviour of the TSG riot police on the 26th of September, because the demonstration was absolutely, completely peaceful. Columns of riot police waded into the crowds, batons drawn, people were injured, people's faces were bloodied, a woman was pushed off her chair. That, to me, is unacceptable behaviour from that unit of the Metropolitan Police. Who gave the order for that to happen? Uh, Chairman, I'm not, I'm not sure if... I just don't know enough about the facts. I'm not sure mm. if I can accept the premise of the facts instead of by the right. a member. Images of police brutality and unlawful arrests against people who are defending their human rights are also being shared around the world. The French capital, once again the scene of clashes between police and demonstrators.
Israeli police fired water cannons to disperse demonstrators. Anti-government rallies have filled the streets of Serbia's capital, Belgrade, for a second day. Police made 74 arrests and handed out 176 fines as protesters assembled for a second day in a row. Oh, I'm so scared, it's ruining our business. The testing is a sham, it's decimating our whole economy. I've been in law enforcement for 10 years. I've seen officers nationwide enforcing tyrannical orders against the people. Because every time I turn on the television, every time I look to the internet, I'm seeing people arrested or cited for going to church, for traveling on the roadways, for going surfing, opening their businesses, and arrest them and charge them with, with what? With a crime? I don't, I don't know what crime people are committing we need to start looking at ourselves as officers and thinking, is what I'm doing right? Now, I wanna remind you that regardless of where you stand on the coronavirus, we don't have the authority to do those things to people just because a mayor or a governor tells you otherwise. We don't get to violate people's constitutional rights because somebody in our chain of command tells us otherwise. In November 2020, Italian police removed their helmets in solidarity with protesters following 18 days of protesting. At the end of World War II, a series of tribunals were held in Nuremberg, Germany, for the prosecution of prominent members of the Nazi party. Opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. Their defense that they were just following orders was not enough to escape punishment. That same year, Yale University psychologist Stanley Milgram conducted a series of experiments that tested whether ordinary people would inflict harm on another person after following orders from an authoritative figure. 150 volts. Answer, force. <laughs> Experiment, that's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. I refuse to go in. Let me out. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor and the so-called sharks harmless. You're going to get a shock. 180 volts. Alarmingly, the results suggested that any human was capable of this due to feeling disconnected from their actions when they comply with orders. Following the trials, the Nuremberg Code was created to protect people's human rights. They include, voluntary consent is essential. 
human experiments should be based on previous animal experimentation and experiments should be conducted by avoiding suffering and injury. With the current rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination programme, we now see these fundamental human rights being violated again. We and others in the post-war consensus led to uh, an international law that says uh, that no medical procedure may be performed on a human being without their informed consent, and they must benefit from it. Your government doesn't have the right to override that law. So if people are saying you've got to, otherwise you can't, you can't go shopping, or you can't go to work or travel, take them to court. Absolutely illegal, and no one should stand for it. 75 years ago, Herman Goering testified at the Nuremberg trials, and he was asked, how did you make the German people go along with all this? And he said, it's an easy thing. It's not anything to do with Nazism. It has to do with human nature. The only thing a government needs to make people into slaves is fear. And if you can figure out something to make them scared, you can get them to do anything that you want. Governments love pandemics. They love pandemics for the same reason they love war. Because it gives them the ability to impose controls on the population that the population would otherwise never accept. And we're telling them today, you are not going to take away our freedoms. You are not going to poison our children. We are going to demand our democracy back. Thank you all very much for fighting. You know, 75 years ago, we had millions of men, 18-year-old boys, 19-year-old men, 20-year-old men, 23-year-old men going out, fighting for king and country, for queen and country, fighting for liberties. These were brave, courageous young men. They were shitting themselves the night before they went to war. They were terrified, but they did it. And we now today, us liberal intellectual men, we're too afraid to go on the street, to tear off a fucking mask off our face, excuse my language. This is the only time it is relevant to use bad language. We have got to step out of the indentureship, the enslavement, because it is not going to just remove itself. There is no rescue mission. There is no cavalry coming to rescue us. This is going to get a lot worse. And now we can see it's out of control. How many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world have died? from other matters connected to the forced lockdown, the self-isolationing, grandparents unable to look into the eyes of their children and their grandchildren. These are crimes against humanity that cannot even be calculated, okay? But when the audit is done, and it will be done, we will see that this corona crowning event was the crowning glory of the emancipation of humanity. It is time for humanity to reclaim ourselves from this draconian tyranny. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. So, do you believe that receiving the vaccine will enable our lives to return back to normal? You're quite emotional about that. Well, it's just, uh, it's been, you know, it's been such a tough year for so many people. You know, we can get on with our lives. Or will we see a new normal? A world with harsh, tyrannical rules, governed by a centralised totalitarian state. Here's what Klaus Schwab thinks. People assume uh, we are just going back uh, to the good old world which we had um, and everything will be normal again in how we are used to normal in the old fashion. This is, uh, let's say, fiction. It will not happen. Um, see, see, uh, cut. There is an incredible movement beginning to take form here in Spain. A group of police officers have come together to start an organization called Policias por la Libertad. 
police for freedom. And now we are marching together with them, standing up for our human rights and constitutional liberties. History tells us that once the peaceful resistance gains the support of the police or the military, we have 60% higher probability to be able to dismantle a tyrannical government. And this is what is taking place right now. November 2020, Stockholm. Experts in healthcare, law and banking from around the world have formed an alliance with a mission to protect our freedoms. Welcome everyone to Stockholm. My name is Professor Dolores Cahill from Ireland and it is my great honour and privilege to welcome you to a worldwide organisation, the World Freedom Alliance. And our goal is to provide information for what has been happening, to try and coordinate that we can defend our freedoms and our rights, and that we can ensure that the governments that we elect will actually defend our freedoms and rights. So we want to educate you, we want to empower you, we want to welcome you to a world where you can be healthy, you can be free, and you can hold people to account if they do something wrong. Many people have been hoodwinked into believing that the government give us our rights. That could not be further from the truth. Every constitution in the world is a code of conduct for governments to follow, to ensure and protect and defend and vindicate and uphold your rights, our rights, that have been given to us by our Creator. The government doesn't give us our rights. The government is obliged to protect those rights. These positive images are reassuring and provide much needed hope. But significant economic damage has already been done. This would inevitably leave many dependent on receiving a universal basic income, placing us in a weaker position to rebel or oppose their tyrannical terms. But this might be a long way off. Or is it happening already? Given this significant uncertainty, a worsening economic backdrop and the need to give people and businesses security through the winter, I believe it is right to go further. So we can announce today that the furlough scheme will not be extended for one month. It will be extended until the end of March. How will it end? 